automotive print market, about the challenges that this market has caused for scholars, libraries, pub, um, publishers, and booksellers. He has, he has published over 100 uh, publications uh, indexed in library literature. Uh, and he's continued to, to publish um, uh, at a reasonable pace, even at this point of his seniority. For example, uh, in 2012, he has a piece with um, uh, General Thomas entitled Management versus Repetitive Tasks Avoiding Working for the Weekend, a Crash Course in Motivating Library Staff faced with seemingly endless tasks. It was published in the uh, New Library World. Uh, and then with, with another colleague, uh, he published the history of the e-book, The Changing Face of Books, Technical Services. And this was published in Technical Services uh, Quarterly. And with another colleague, he has a piece entitled Information and Learning Commons, Some Reflections, and this was published. These are all very recent publications. Uh, another one is an overview of the Google Books project and other digit digitization initiatives, uh, implications for libraries. Uh, this was published in the Journal of Library and Information Sciences. And uh, there's another piece on Google, Google Books Search and Metadata, Cataloging and Classification. Uh, classification quarterly. So he has been publishing um, uh, at, a, at a good pace, even though he is a very senior uh, professor. Um, Robert Kent is very highly qualified for his work. He, he, he earned a BA in French and Latin from Xavier University, and he did that summa cum laude. You have to pause. <laughs> <laughs> Should I blush? <laughs> getting summa cum laude in, in, in French and Latin. And then he went on to um, he went on to Colombia and got a master's uh, in library science and then uh, to prove that he's smart in various various prestigious places, he went on to Yale to get a PhD in French literature. Um, and he has been a tremendous friend of the, the Humanity Center. Um, he has uh, been a resident scholar in um, 2005, 2006, and then 2009, 2010. He has given four other Brombach talks. This is his fifth Brombach talk. And he has always been willing to, to, to come to our talks and to advise me whenever uh, I, I, I need advice. So I'm very, very happy to ask you to welcome to the podium with applause, Professor Robert Hoyt. Okay, I, I'm actually going to be talking about some of the things from the introduction a little bit later. Um, basically, what I want to talk about is the fact that the scholarly communication crisis is not just out there, but there are things then within the university community that have helped it along and may even be at the fundamental reasons for it. Um, to give a bit of background, I was thinking of wanting to come here again. And uh, what had happened was that I had worked with a student, and I'll we'll talk about that in a minute, who did a brilliant article on open access. It, it was a wonderful article. And I thought about an early article that I had actually written maybe five years ago on the topic I'm talking about today. And what surprised me a bit was that this was just a short column, but it had three citations, which is the most any of these short columns have ever had. And one of the people who cited me was writing an article on it, and he commented on how very few people had talked about this complicity, and so that this is 
in some ways what I consider a bit of a, a hidden secret of scholarly communication. Uh, I, I follow scholarly communication a lot. Uh, I get inside higher ed, I'm on the scholarly communications uh, discussion list. And so I, I have noted that in some ways there really isn't a whole lot of talk about some of the things I'm going to talk about today. So I thought I'd come and make Walter happy and give this talk today. I, I'm going to focus more on serials. I think serials are the main part of the problem. I may talk a little bit about books toward the end. The other credential I think I have is that I've been serving on tenure and promotion committees both for librarians and for faculty since 1980. But the most important piece was in one of these rooms sitting on the university tenure and promotion committee. And some of the major points I'm going to be making today come from those experiences. And I think it will explain in a, in a, a, a bit why these things happen. Uh, okay, why? Well, this may be the main reason, and I'm not sure though it's complicity, and it's called the law of supply and demand. I once asked what would be the best thing that could happen for PhDs in the humanities, and I said repeal the law of supply and demand. And so I'm actually old enough that I was there in graduate school during the boom years. And I actually have the dubious honor of having been there at the first year when the market turned, which happened to be the year I was looking for a position in French. And actually, it's opposite. I got my master's after I got my PhD. But it was 1970, 1971, and we all expected to have wonderful multiple authors, offers, because this is what had been happening for years. And suddenly, at the end of the period, I didn't have a job. And so I wandered over to the library. Um, I was married to a librarian then, and I'm married to another librarian now, who said, you'll like the library. And I liked it so much that six months later, I was commuting to library school at Columbia and began my career as a librarian. Just to be real short, I actually published um, enough as a librarian that Dean Peter Spires Duran in 1993 called me into his office one day and said, Bob, how would you like to be a professor? And on the principle that you always choose something new, I said, okay. And so that's how I wound up here instead of being in the library. But this increased competition, which has only gotten worse, because as I said, only 20% of humanities PhDs got tenure track positions last year, has literally meant that unlike 1969, when all you needed to do was to have your PhD and you got a job, we keep upping the standards. We up the standards both to get people hired, and we up the standards to get for people to get tenure. And so I've been a mentor since 94 to our faculty. And I will note that even since 94, we have kind of told them that the expectations are higher than they used to be. And so this increased competition has meant that universities can require more publication, and they do, in probably almost all disciplines. And maybe there are a few exceptions, and maybe they are changing. I've heard, for example, that it still may be difficult to get people to teach in the business school because of the fact that they can make so much more money working outside. And so universities <coughs> demand not only more from their tenure track people, uh, as we have done at Wayne, there are efforts to impose publication requirements on tenured faculty too. And I'd also like to note that to get graduate status now, you have to do a lot more than you needed to get graduate status, I think, four or five years ago. And so the standards keep moving up. All right, so we got all these people publishing like mad. And then, and I hear this all the time on Inside Higher Ed, we've got all the adjuncts publishing. 
because they don't have jobs, they're working in these poorly paid positions, I feel horrible for them, really. And so what they figure is, well, if I can just get a few more publications, I might get a tenure track job. And so they're publishing. And then it even gets worse. I didn't have to publish as a doctoral student back in the good old days. But now we have doctoral students who assume that they have to have a couple of publications before a search committee will even look at them. And so I look at the resumes that come across our desk and virtually everybody has a publication. The second one, it's come down to the master's level. And Walter did a great job for me because actually all of those publications were when I was a second author because I had made 12 of my master's students very happy by taking their quality work and getting it published. And this is good for them because they have a publication. It's good for me because I'm co-author. And it fits in with the university objective of having professors work with students. I decided to do this one year because I also do a lot of peer reviewing. And I suddenly realized that my students were doing better work than many of the articles I was getting to peer review. And so there hasn't been a publication that hasn't been accepted from the ones that I've helped the students. And I actually do help them. I just don't put my name on it. I edit it. I tell them where it needs to get better. I take care of the submission process. And actually, in one case, and this, I, I, I realize I'm going to try to have the student get our Student of the Year Award this year. The, the, the student in my academic library's class wrote a brilliant publication on open access that I'll talk a little bit more about later. And I shouldn't say it, but when people talk about things, I mailed it in at 8 o'clock on Sunday morning, and at 10 o'clock the editor told me he was going to publish it. Now, it's officially a peer-reviewed journal, so that isn't exactly honest, but things like this do happen. And then finally, it's even coming down to undergraduates. How many of you have seen this billboard? It was on Woodward, and I worked with my professor as an undergraduate to get my research published. So it's even coming down to undergraduate publications. And so my final comment here is that everybody needs to run faster just to stay in place. So we have all of these people pushing out the publications. We even have the increase in publications from abroad. Uh, China is on a big push to get their scholars to be more recognized. I get lots and lots of papers to review from the Emirates. And so it's not even just an American phenomenon, it's a global phenomenon. So what are the publishers doing? Uh, they're pleased. So the publishers certainly oblige. So they, at least until now, and there may be some changes to it, they kept creating new publications for the new research. And they would go out and they would sell it to libraries. And I know at least one publisher in our field that's subsequently been merged, that they try almost any publication out. If, if enough people bought it, they keep it. If enough people didn't buy it, they wouldn't. And the market was libraries. The other thing is the fragmentation of scholarship. And so that we used to have disciplines, and then they subdivide, and then they subdivide some more. And as the disciplines subdivide, that they continue to then want a journal to deal with their subdiscipline. Uh, one thing I'm actually leaving out, and by publishers there, I don't even, I guess, mean commercial publishers. Because the society publishers, in some ways, haven't been much better. Uh, they often use their publications to subsidize their other activities. I know that lots of places do it. This is, society publications often appear on these discussion lists. The American Library Association has a bunch of publications, and they use it to subsidize the fact, because membership dues only pay for about 20% of their operating expenditures. And so then the publishers can charge high prices, especially in the STEM disciplines. And I'm going to give you a couple examples of what these high prices are. Um, Journal of Comparative Neurology, $29,000 for a yearly subscription. Brain Research. Uh, note, 
the disciplines in which all of those publications are. These are in the STEM disciplines. That's where the research money is. And so they are able to charge more and they get people to subscribe. I should have checked. See the numbers in the back here. Read them on to us. Okay. Uh, Journal of Comparative Neurology, 29,000. Brain Research, 23. Applied Polymer Science, 22. Tetrahedron, 22. Neuroscience Research, 21. Cellular Physiology, 17. And Chemical Physics Letter, 16. In, in what field is tetrahedron? Um, chemistry. Chemistry? Yeah, yeah okay. that's in chemistry. Oh, good. <laughs> but it's not, not you. Not <laughs> you. Okay. Yeah, okay. Because I never heard of it. And then inflation, inflation costs. I got another slide. So this is how inflation costs are. This, these are relatively recent figures. And so that the prices both for journals uh, and also somewhat for books are going up. Uh, the difference between serials and books is that books you can decide not to purchase them. Journals, once you have a subscription and your faculty and students like the journal, it's much harder to cancel it than it is just to not buy a book. And so this has also been the reason why libraries have moved funding from purchasing books to purchasing journals. The old statistic used to be 60% of serials, 40% books. It's now 90-10 when you include the databases that we buy that are often full text journals too. All right, scholarly communication in libraries. I, I'm, you probably know this, but I'm going to go over it. But the argument is, that the government gives grants to produce research. The scholars that produce the research have to publish their results. Uh, the other thing they do is that they also will often break it up into multiple articles. So that rather than just publishing one substantive article on the project, they will have, this is what we did in step one, this is what we did in step two, this is what we did in step three. So you get three articles which count more than one. The researcher is then asked to sign away all of their rights. Uh, some researchers perhaps can resist them, but many don't. Um, I'm a bad child. I haven't really posed many problems when somebody said to sign on the dotted line. Uh, I find an irony in the fact that I had to sign all way all my rights on the article on open access. <laughs> and so there's, there's a little bit, that's a little bit ironical. And then what happens is that the publishers sell this research back to libraries at a high cost. And the issue here is, well, why can't you not get them? And the answer is that, as I showed you on the list, the high-impact high impact journals in the STEM fields know that they can charge more because of their being needed by the scholars. Uh, part of the problem here, and I'm not going to talk much about this, there are those that worry that the system is going to collapse because libraries are money, running out of money to buy these journals and something's going to have to give. But we're not there yet. We may be there in five years, but we're not there yet. Maybe, maybe journals will just have to reduce their price because uh, nobody buys them. Um, actually, there have been a few mergers of journals. Oh, okay. So two journals become one. Um, on the other hand, the commercial publishers when you look at their reports, I, this was a few years ago, but one of the people said, well, Elsevier, one of the major villains, according to libraries, was commenting that they had 38% increased profits over the year before. So if we do have a villain in the library world, it tends to be that publisher. Um, so what have libraries and some administrators tried to do to change the system? The, the first thing has been open access and the open access principle is that you don't sign your copy right away you use preprints or post prints and you make your research available uh, to everyone for no cost we, we have an institutional repository here called the digital commons um, there are two ways of doing it and the institutional repository is called green open access because no money changes hands so each year, at the end of March, when I do my annual 
dossier, I send all of my publications of the year before over to Josh, who is our person who is responsible for the digital commons. And he looks at it and he says, I can do this one, I can do that one. I can't do the published version of this. Do you have a preprint? And I have a preprint, so I send it to him. Uh, I'm going to say right now, this is great for faculty. If you don't do it, I would suggest that you do. The next slide is going to explain why it isn't all that great for libraries. So I've done it, and I have 13,525 downloads from 72 papers that I happen to have in two repositories because I publish a lot for a group that also deposits everything at Purdue. And I do have to say that I think this has made a big difference in my citation counts, which I don't know what to say. I still have enough of an ego that it's important, even though it really isn't anymore at this point of my career. But, but it is important for somebody starting out. And so I push our tenure track faculty very much to get their materials. And actually, Hermina has a champion open access article. How many downloads have you had? Do you remember? It was a class project, so again, working with students. And um, it was in the, it has been in the uh, digital commons at Wayne State since April two years back. And it has more than 8,000, just one, one piece, 8,000 downloads. OK. So it's very good for faculty. I should also say, in, in doing this, I happen to look at B Press, and I, I'm listed as one of their most downloaded authors. So, All right, the second one is Gold Open Access. Uh, gold Open Access is a different beast because the publisher says, you can either sign away the copyright or you can pay me lots of money. And um, what happens there is that they say, uh, I, I just published 4,000 word, and they said, well, we'll make it open access if you send us $1,600. And I, of course, didn't send them $1,600. Now, there's two ways of doing it. The first one is to make the complete journal freely available. One of the issues there is that there are now predatory open access journals where they don't really have any scholarly worth, but they keep sending you emails and say, we will publish it, and we're really great, but they're not really great. About once a week. Right. Probably. Not. And so there's lists of these. Um, and there are those people, the adjuncts, tenure track people, and let me give you one more story about how desperate they can be. I, I realized at once when I went to what I would call a third-rate local conference, and I went this time to the French section instead of to the library science section, and we had people who paid to come from Europe to give papers at this conference because they were so desperate to get a presentation in hopes that it would further their academic career. So that there are plenty of these predatory journals that still get people who somehow find the money to do it. Uh, the other issue will be if you just do some articles in the journal, it's no savings for the library because you still have to buy the journal to get the ones that aren't open access. And so if this journal, which was a relatively important one, if I had made my open access, there would have been others that wouldn't have been. And so we would still have probably uh, subscribed to it, support the library and information science faculty. So, um, OK. Uh, and also, the other thing that can happen is that even if the gold open access has even a minimal cost to it, uh, that minimal cost is still going to be more than you're paying now because you had one and you had two. Now you have two. This happened in some cases earlier on when the editorial boards of a few quite expensive journals rebelled. And so what they said was that we're going to go out and we're going to create our own journal and it's going to be less expensive, but that still means that the library needed to buy two journals instead of one as someone in this area pointed out to me. And 
So it didn't really save libraries. Um, the other problem with open access, or one of them, is the impact factor and their reputation. And I'm not saying that the quality of the research is any less. It's just that you don't build an impact factor and you don't build recognizable quality right away. And so it takes time to acquire this. Plus, if the person, okay, I think, yes. Okay, the complicity part is going to be why the person isn't going to send it to an open access journal first is that the universities want their faculty to publish in the high impact journals and the high impact journals are the one with great prestige and they're the ones that charge a lot and so in a sense their person feels pushed to go to the exact journals that are causing the problems. So this is where I say that part of the complicity is. The second piece is that this is especially true for any university that wants to move up in the academic world. And I've been here since 88, and I, I actually once heard from an administrator a bit the story about how Wayne became a research institution. And so this really was one of the factors at Wayne. We wanted to bring faculty who would increase our research, be able to get credibility by having their research appear in these high impact journals. And so it was very important. I remember once talking to an administrator when there were some thoughts about perhaps we should, um, we should try to reduce the number of journals by causing our faculty to have to publish in open access or make open access. And the quick answer to that is not possible because we have a union contract that gives copyright to the authors, so the university can't do anything without changing it. But he kind of looked at me and he said, well, we want more journals where our faculty can publish. And so that is a bit what I think is behind the complicity. Uh, also, there have been efforts, really, for some universities to say, uh, go, go and announce in public, we now require all of our faculty not to sign away their copyright, and we have to make it freely available. Um, my first point is, it's places like Harvard. Um, Harvard doesn't have to worry about its reputation. It already has one. And the second one is we had a, a major person in the movement come and give a talk here. And we went into how wonderful this was. And I kind of showed up at the end. I didn't ask this question in public. I could be real bad about embarrassing questions. But I wanted to be nice that day. And I said, well, what happens if Nature won't publish this article unless you sign your copyright away? And she said, well, of course we make exceptions. And so I'm not sure how much this will really make a difference even when there is a rule in place because I'm quite sure that in those cases where it's important, all you have to do is ask nicely and some exception will be made. The final thing is faculty don't really care about journal costs. Um, <laughs> I sit on the editorial board of a journal, and I, I was amazed when I discovered how much the library system had to play to get that publication. Uh, I care that I've got access to it. I think many of you care more about the access. And it's kind of like the only time you worry is when the library comes and says, well, you know, we don't really have the money anymore. We may have to cut your journal. And you say, oh, no, no, you can't do that. Um, all right. The other thing I'm going to talk about beyond that complicity, there is indeed the complicity of the tenure and promotion committees. And it makes perfect sense. All right, I, 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 know, an, I know library science. Uh, with my humanities background, I understand the humanities. 
when I sat on the Tenure and Promotion Committee, I didn't even understand the articles that I read in the hard sciences. They were talking about things way beyond my knowledge at a level of complexity. And I expect that those people in the hard sciences had the same trouble with some of the publications in my fields. Um, we had a faculty member who wrote on how computer science was taking over uh, various linguistic tools to be able to make the discipline more important. I have a background in the area. I, I could read about 10 pages each day, mull over it. I would understand it and then I would be exhausted and I'd read another 10 the next. Or how is somebody to know, and this is a real topic in French, the debate over whether Quebec literature is a colonial literature or not because Canada is an independent country, but have the English dominated them to the point that it's really a colony. And so how do you understand the quality of related uh, disciplines? The, the other thing is, how do you understand even the disciplinary conventions? Um, when we got to certain areas, we would have the person representing that area explain to us, well, in this area, the primary author is the first one, and the leader of the research team is the last one. Or in this area, it is quite permissible to have 43 authors on the work. This person is still doing important work. Um, I had a very good friend who was a biostatistician, and she had 20 publications a year, but she was one of many, many authors, and all she did for all of them was the statistics. And then you will get another discipline come in and say, well, we're a discipline where the book counts, and so we're not going to have many journal articles. And so one of the things that everyone on the committee had to learn was what counts and what doesn't count. And this isn't even quality. This is just understanding things. And so what it is easy to do is to fall back on the traditional measures of quality. And I'm going to start with what I would call the tyranny of peer review. Um, I once, in my own field, uh, wrote an article about publishing for librarians where they had faculty status so that they were similar enough to faculty that they had to publish to get promoted. And I explained that you have just written a wonderful article on some brand new thing that you're doing and what do you do with it? And on the one hand, you could put it out right away in a major journal like Library Journal or American Libraries. Thousands of people would read it. 60,000 people get American Libraries. It would be great for your reputation. Other people might take this improvement and apply it in their libraries. But if you're in tenure track where it needs to be peer reviewed, what you can do instead or should do instead is send it to some journal where it will take six to nine months to come out so it's no longer relevant. Um, I once published in a peer reviewed journal that when I looked it up it had 33 subscribers. Uh, I'm being more honest here than perhaps I should be. And, but this will be what counts for you. Um, I'm not going to say much more, but we had one of our faculty who did the same thing. She published in a marvelous journal with high impact, lots and lots of people reading it, but it doesn't count the same because this was not a peer-reviewed journal. So this is why I'm talking about the tyranny of peer review. The second one, which we've talked about, is journal prestige. Um, this may be warranted or not warranted. I suspect in many cases it is warranted, so I'm not going to quibble about that one. Um, then there's the impact factors. Um, I never really quite understood how they get figured out. I've, I've read a couple articles about it, and one of these days I'm going to have to have somebody sit me down. And, but then I'm going to say a bit about citation counts. Um, what do citation counts mean? 
Let me give again my own story. My most cited article right now is one of those student papers where I'm listed as second author. As of yesterday, I have 53 citations, which is lots and lots of citations. It's a perfectly fine article, but all it is was a summary of the literature at that point, and it includes absolutely no original research. But because it's on Web 2.0, it's extremely popular and I think has been cited by 10 or 15 papers just this year. And so I'm not even, all right, I, I have two wonderful research articles. I got grants to do them. I went to Canada and spent time doing original research. I even did some archival research. They were published in the most prestigious journal in that area. And I've got three citations to one and two citations to the other because while it's wonderful research, and I have no problems that this paper will still be valid 25 years from now, while the one with the 53 citations will just kind of be a footnote that nobody will bother with anymore. But if you're just looking at it, it's more about the popularity of the research, and it may be less about the quality of the research. Um, I'm also going to say that the other thing is that, and I would like somebody to correct me if I'm wrong, but forget what the discipline is, but some of the cutting edge disciplines with relatively small numbers of faculty, they're in absolute contact all the time. They're working on exactly the same issues and they exchange emails to tell everybody where they are. I think subatomic particles is one of those or one that I talked about. Okay, nanotechnology, those things. And that actually it doesn't, it only gets published as historical record because by the time it gets published, it's already out of date, or at least this is what I have read. So I'm, all right, I'm accurate, I'm getting seen. All right, so that these areas will be more likely to get the citations because everybody's working on the same thing. They need to know about each other's work, and so it occurs and it's got prestige. Uh, I, I have several articles in which I deal with the fact that many parts of the humanities are silos. And that, I'm going to give the example of my dissertation. I found the perfect dissertation topic years ago because it was a minor subject that nobody had ever, ever written anything about or only one person had written anything about. So I got to start writing with just a couple months research. Um, I got my dissertation finished quickly and I graduated to no job, but I didn't really expect that anybody else is going to be interested in that research. Um, I'm surprised that it actually has two citations since 1971. And since I work with the faculty in the Romance languages, there are some incredibly good scholars there who are extremely well respected in their field, but their field is very, very narrow. And unless you're interested in those narrow things, you don't get much credit outside of this narrow field. I, I know that some of you, I, I'll get to that in a minute. And so these humanity disciplines, some of the wider ones when the broader topics, yes, but if, I'm, if, if I were to become interested in a minor 18th century author, there would be relatively few people that would like my search even if my research were brilliant. And so, as I said, there's an issue of, of silos. Um, part of the problem for libraries is that these people working in silo areas are going to legitimately come and ask the library to buy materials to support their research and the library knows damn well that that's the only person that ever is going to use this material unless someone happens to write a dissertation under that person and has to do the same thing. But we need to support them. I feel very bad for them. At times we don't support them more. 
And that finally, we've got the issue that publication favors those areas where the person that publishes the journal can make money. So if this is not an area where there's going to be many sub subscribers, unless it's, someone subsidizes it, if it's a scholarly publication, if it's, a, if it's a labor of love by somebody who really loves the field, there's not going to be as many publishing outlets. And so I, since I'm here, I'm going to ask the broader question, which I've actually brought up on several discussion lists when I've commented, does this really mean that we're going to stop hiring these niche researchers at the university level? So when we look at somebody to bring on campus, once the people who have built their careers in very small areas disappear, is there going to be an increasing expectation that they deal with a broad enough area that they're not going to have problems getting their research disseminated so that they will get into good journals where if they're in a tenure book area, university presses are going to accept their proposal. And so I wonder how this will affect scholarly communication. I'm now going to talk about something that I have thought a lot about. I don't think it's going to happen to give my conclusion first is that we could move away from the commercial model. I talked about this the last time I was here giving my talk, and I was basically dealing with self-publishing. Um, there are actually scholars now who don't care about tenure and promotion, who are self-publishing for several reasons. Maybe the first one is nobody will publish what they want to have published. Uh, the second, though, is that the person who wrote an article for me for something I edited said that he liked having the control over the product. So that if he wants to include 300 pages of supplementary material, he just puts the link into the self-published manuscript. If he wants to have 35 photographs, nobody's going to stop him because photographs cost too much. I, I'm also going to say the same thing can happen for articles. Um, and in fact, I just read something this week that the University of Liverpool is going to do this. And so they're going to say, you send us the article, you pay us a bit of money, and we will basically say, this is good enough to publish even if you don't publish it. Um, what I would like to have happen is to get disciplinary review bodies that would indeed be tough enough to say there is nothing wrong with this scholarship except that it isn't commercially viable. It's great scholarship, it's just too much of a niche, or, and, and somehow these bodies would have to be tough enough that they would become credible. I also think that there would have to be a relatively low evaluation fee. Um, I think maybe three to five hundred dollars would be reasonable. Maybe you'd even pay the peer review or something. But the real issue would be, will we get university P and T committees to change to accept this? Um, I don't know how the, whether this would happen. Now it could happen at the administrative level. I know that here that the PT gives a recommendation to the provost, but the provost is ultimately the one that decides. So if you had a provost that basically said, yes, I think this is a good idea, it could happen, or it could even be something that could be communicated to the committee. Uh, I think that this model is feasible. As I said, though, I, it, would it would cause a mind change, a real shift in how we regard scholarly communication. Um, so I'm not sure what's going to happen. Okay, I'm done a bit early. That's not necessarily bad. And so do you have any questions? I took a biotechnology class last winter, and uh, um, I was told that uh, if 
people publish, if, well, if they do research like in a community, in a university laboratory, and it leads to some type of um, product that's developed, you know, that um, they can, uh, well, this one man had done it. He worked for like a Midwestern university. Right. It wasn't this university. And uh, he, and after he retired, he tried to um, right. get the uh, credit for it. And, and so he would get money from the development of it. And like a, right. uh, this was like pharmaceutical or something. Okay. And so anyways, he, uh, he, when he tried to get it, you know, author, right. the author of, of the research, the, the university found out about it and they said, well, he worked in our lab, yeah, right. so he can't claim it because it's, you know, our money and okay. whatever. Okay, let me talk a bit about this. Uh, again, um, patents are different. Oh, yeah, this was patents. Okay, and I, I heard tell of some person before they had rules about the university capturing part of the patent revenue who had made several million dollars. But after a few of the cases like that occurred, the universities have argued to have control over patents for the very reason that you say. And normally there is a sharing between the university and the researcher. The reason why this doesn't happen for publications and it, there are those that think that if it went to court, the judges might rule that everything I publish, <coughs> the patent belongs, uh, the, the, uh, the copyright belongs to the university. But universities have tended not to fight over this issue because publications don't have the large sums of money attached to them that patents do. Um, I actually happen to have been at Yale when Eric Siegel wrote Love Story. Um, I, I would have hoped that he did it all at home on his own time, and then they couldn't have claimed all the money he made. Um, I actually had a friend who went to this TA, and rumor had it he almost didn't get tenure because he was considered to have been too much of a popularizer. So the, the success of Love Story worked against it. But patents, um, for example, uh, one of the experts on copyright that was here and is now at U of M is Jessica Lippman. And <clears throat> I still remember her. It was a wonderful presentation. It's just basically in the academic community, about one third of the universities explicitly give copyright to their faculty. One third are silent and one-third claim copyright, even though they don't do anything about it. And actually, University of Michigan is one of the ones that claims copyright, but they don't do anything about it. So in other words, though, if they wanted to sue somebody to get the copyright for something, they are saying, we have not given it away. This is our claim because they did it with university resources. Um, Linguistic Society of America has been wrestling with this issue. That's the, the, the national professional organization for linguists in, in the United States. Um, and it, it has a, a, a journal that, is, that they publish, is published through the traditional means and experiences all the issues you've been talking about, except that it's not ridiculously expensive, I think. Although I actually don't know how much the library pays for it. Uh, you, you get a subscription with your membership as a faculty member. Um, but of course, the libraries are not. So I mean, I know I'm a life member, so it doesn't count. But I, I know how many, I think it's $150 for yes, so it's ordinary not that people. Expensive. It's expensive as a journal. It's cheap. They don't yeah. give it to you. As a, yeah. Right. So. But, um, but the society also publishes two electronic journals that it is using the open access model to publish with serious editorial review, which of course is always the problem with ac open access journals, is that you've got to get people who are willing to give away a large hunk of their lives to be the editors of open access journals, given that they're not going to get paid for it, unlike commercial journals where they sometimes do. Well, why couldn't they get paid for it? Sorry? Why couldn't they get paid for it? Uh, because the Linguistic Society can't afford it. Okay, let, let me add one comment. Uh, the, uh, again, within the last six months, I read a column about the commercial publishers trying to sweep these society publications into their fold. The well, I, I'm, the, the LSA has put together a committee, Committee on Scientific Communication of Information and Linguistics, uh, to start worrying about this issue, uh, and has asked me to chair it. 
So I am collecting as much information as I can about how we're going to hassle, handle okay. uh, some <laughs> interesting speech. Okay. Okay. Thank Anybody you, Dr. Here, Freud. You, if you're interested in this topic, you might uh, subscribe to something called the Scholarly Kitchen. And I'm quite sure that there would be some of the articles that would be of interest to you, and you might want to go back in the archives. Well, the other thing you should do is actually touch base with Joshua, Ned Fox, and Michael Priest in the library, who are experts, too, yep. Yep. in scholarly communications and open access, actually. Um, and they will have a lot of um, both good information, but also opinions I on don't what doubt works it. And, and what doesn't work. I, I know Joshua. I yeah. thought he does. I will thank you. That they will are. Uh, they would be ecstatic to talk to anyone about this topic. Who was the second person? Michael Priest. Joshua will know. Yeah. So, um, how much of the difference in the increase in cost of of journals compared to the general CPI can you attribute to what we call in math? It, 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 it's called the inventiones effect. Okay. So, so, so the inventiones mathematica. Is one of the two or or three or three best journals? It was published by not by Elsevier but by Springer. Oh, by, by by Springer, yes. And then about I haven't followed this lately, but about ten years ago, they raised their price and the libraries stopped subscribing. So they raised their price more, and so more libraries stopped subscribing, and it, it was this kind of vicious circle. Right, right. That um, that is that is one of the things that happens, and so the fixed costs remain the same. Right. and the number of subscriptions decline. Right. So you're bringing up one of the other reasons why this may get to the point where it's no longer possible to sustain the model. Right. The other thing I didn't talk about is something called the big deal, where you are want a certain number of journals, and the, uh, the person selling it to you says, we will kick oh. in all of these extra journals for not a whole lot more money, and so lots of people take the big deal. But then that causes a problem that faculty don't understand because when it comes time to cut journals, they say, well, but you're getting all of these horrible things. Why don't you cut them? And the library has to respond, well, they're part of the deal. And if we cut them, we wouldn't save anything. Uh, the other amazing thing that I have mentioned in some of my publications is that because of the big deal, because of other things, there will be publications where you get multiple access. My favorite one, because it's in my own field, is Library Journal. The last time I looked, we had 16 different ways to get access to Library Journal. And the time range and the mode of access varies from one to the other. So that one will have the full issues, another will have only, you have to know the, the article you're looking for to find it, and I have to remember that when I need things for my class, I go to ProQuest Gold because it has the information in the way that I would like it. But the spiraling downward is indeed part of the issue. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen when we get to the point where there may be journals that go out of business. And I want to. to no, go ahead. No, no. Um, I just had a question for junior faculty. Um, and because I think I'm like a upcoming scholar at some point, and I know uh, the university I'm I'm at, we made offers to public intellectuals, um, a junior scholar that was a public intellectual more than he was a let's publish in the top journal. Um, what does this new? And I'm also in like a very social science. I'm in political science, so like it's sexy to be in politics. So what do you, what do you say about kind of balancing? the public intellectual and actually scholarly writing. Being a public intellectual takes a lot of time and effort in a way that I would much rather sit at my computer and crunch numbers than go and talk in front of 8,000 people about my research. Like I just, so what's the balance there okay, in the, trying to get? The, the thing is, it's better to get published than not published. That, that's the first thing. The, you should aim for the better journals but it's better to have something published in a second or third tier journal than to not have it published at all. Yeah, but, but, but I'm not sure that that's what you meant. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm asking the question about, so we made offers to public intellectuals and we had people who from top universities, he was from top university as well, right. but um, we made offers to someone that 
you would think wouldn't have thought it because this the other scholars have published in top journals like our one and two journals and they didn't get the offer but because he's on tv and brings the university more press and oh, they okay. feel like long term yeah. that's that's like yeah. what we need to do instead of yeah he's kind of a pnt hiring yeah. question, yeah. which which has a right. it's going to depend what the department wants press, um, so i think that that's why i think that um and, and this is related to your comment about that you know um, you're in a niche field and, and will we continue to hire people in those fields and i think there's there are two things that, that i kind of like this one is, is that people are, are are trained differently than they were so i i think a lot of the people uh, call them very, very experienced faculty trained in very niche fields were trained at a time when that was a more acceptable way to train scholars. And and I, I found that when I was trained in math way back in the last century, you know, like in the early 1980s, um, that you could be deep in some silo and, it, you know, if I publish enough and if you, you know, then, then you were fine. Whereas now I think that that in, in just all fields that you're expected to be deep and you're expected to be broader than you were before. And I think it's kind of like, I obviously, because I'm a big sports fan, as we come like in sports, I mean, can you, um, can, um, can you play with people? Can you talk to people? Can you actually influence people? Um, and in, in terms of having like a public intellectual rather than a scholar or, or a scholar rather, uh, rather than a public intellectual, it's more is that if you've got a department, you have like a team, and you need certain people who can do this, and you need certain people who can do that. Um, and especially for a, a, a field like poli sci, um, actually, look, um, it, yeah, I think it was a political science professor here who once said to me, there was a reason why why uh, political science professors didn't didn't become politicians, um, and and I think it tends to be true. So and and so I think you need some of both. And I think you know, if you had a department full of the one or full of the other, then you might not have uh, the best department. So, that's what I and I, Wayne State is very pleased, for example, with people who have worked with the community. So I'm, I, I, we get distributed to us the daily news report where Wayne State people are mentioned in the press. And so we have names that repeat because they're dealing with Detroit problems. And so, they have an, a special reason for being here. Right, and, and I think PNT committees are beginning to be more flexible about what they will accept. And I think um, that when, when you talk about citations and kind of like traditional metrics, I find, from my experience, it tends to be universities that are not completely sure of themselves that want to use those quote objective metrics more. Because, it, because many times people don't feel sure of themselves to just decide for themselves. Whereas, it, and I think of like, for example, when I was at the University of Southern California, um, we had a faculty member who had, he was associate professor, he was writing his second book, but he wasn't done yet, he thought he was doing very well. He had to come up for a promotion of full professor. And the PNT committee said, well, you know, you're doing great, you know, just wait a couple more years and, and just finish your second book, write one book for tenure, two books for full professor, just do it. And he said, no, I'm, I'm not gonna wait for that, I am gonna go on the market. And the University of Chicago didn't seem to be as concerned with that, and they hired them away. And I, the, um, with tenure? Did they as hire a full him professor, with tenure? as a full professor. And I said to myself, hmm, that's kind of curious. A yeah. University of Silicon Valley is a good university. But I think most people would argue it's not as good as the University of Chicago. But they didn't seem to mind. They, they, they you know, they saw he was working on his book. Things were going well. He's been doing great for them. And we lost a fabulous faculty member because we were too rigid about our own. And, and I think I, that, that I learned a lot from that, actually, that it's not, it's not just about numbers, um, that it's about the actual impact of the work. And I think if you look at it, you know, if you look at it closely enough, and it's not easy, you know, you know like in some fields, but I think if you, t you know, if you take a close enough look, I think you can really do it. And I, as a dean, have to do it. And, and well, it's only when we get more people like you as a dean differently and who help us get the kind of people on the P&T committees that do think that way, then we actually will make some of these changes. Well, actually, P&T committees are largely elected. So, I know. Yeah, yeah, so so I, I, know. I can't send the contract as not how to say. So, so but I think but, the more people but, we have, but we can guide them, though, and, and again, because because they make a recommendation to us. And I think we can put some context if we don't agree. 
So uh -huh. I'm just one more thing. I just got a, a letter from Claude Schock, and maybe mm -hmm. you've got this too, that's um, entitled The End of the Journal of K-Theory. It's a math journal. Oh, well, that, that is the end of the world. And, uh, <laughs> but the interesting thing about this was that the entire editorial board for the Journal of K-Theory mm -hmm. just resigned. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah in uh, protest over the profits that were being made by the person who actually had agreed to publish the journal and eventually was supposed to be turning it into a um, foundation nonprofit, but uh, found such lucrative business with the, the profits he's making has refused to do any of that. So they are now was en masse have resigned. Was that Anthony Buck? Yes. The guy, yeah, I know him. Yes, yeah, okay. I, will, um, I will say no more. I, I, apparently I will loving the profits uh, well, of the Journal of K-Theory. Yeah. Uh, so. it, well, well, I can attest to um, you, you should not um, you should not be betting your life on, on the profits from the Journal of K-Theory. Well, I'm not. Um, but <laughs> I would be um, willing to support the editorial board that designed and will create, who wants to now create an alternative. Right. Um, I would be willing to support that yeah. because they've stood up, they, they're standing up for uh, helping to reduce the yeah. exact same thing that Bob was talking about, the, the price gouging. And that was a thing um, that, that, again, I haven't followed as, as closely, but, but um, there was a group of a lot of like field medal winners who were very um, concerned and many of them resigned from boards of high price journals and it's in this big... Um, that's, that's the point of the last several where we have yeah. some uh, turnover, and they, that's um, how we've created things like Public Library of Science um, Journal. So where people have said, I, we're not putting up with this anymore, we're going to form our own. And some of these journals now have been operating for, the, for long enough that they now have higher readership and higher impact factors than some of the ones that, that were previously in that yeah. position. But but the thing that, that I think all of this is leading to is that that I think didn't go answered for years because of of the, of the uh, dominance, uh, at least in the fields that I know of publishers, you know, like Springer and Elsevier, is um, who who gets the benefit. I think that's clearer, and I think we all ag agree for the most part that whoever gets the benefit should bear at, at least part of the cost. But but you have the benefit here, you have the cost there, or and and the costs were spread, and, were, and I think it was all kind of that it just kind of morphed into a um, system that I think nobody really understood. Um, and I think we need a kind of a simpler business model, but I think that that's going to mean that universities and, and, and funding bodies, if they're expecting us to, to make this open access, then I think they, they should you know, feel fit to, uh, to bear part of the cost of actually well, holding that's, that's actually a question that I would ask before um, faculty that are in here all leave, would it, is it something that you would value to have a fund at the university that you could apply to, to have your, the cost to publish in a journal, in a gold, open access, which means you pay to be published? Yeah. Would you want to have a fund at the university that would allow you to, to request money, funds, in order to publish in gold, open access? There are many universities now that are managing funds. Um, we don't happen to have a lot of extra money to do that kind of thing, but I've considered, I actually have tried to work with the Office of Research on them over a number of years to put together a fund. Um, and, and I was told like 10 years ago that in the medical field, it is just normal that yeah. you build yeah. this kind of thing into your grant, your grant. Right. and you pay to publish in these journals, but your grant usually pays. But it right. doesn't help for those of us it, who I work in fields doesn't. for which there are no grants. And I like think some grants don't, don't, don't allow for it. Yeah, well, that too. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, um, but, but I think the answer is yes, Sandy. I think, okay. I think okay. people can, can, I, can I make two additional comments? Yes. The, the first one is the open access probably helps smaller institutions more because they get a lot more content. Right. And I believe it was Cornell that figured that paying all their author's fees would cost more than the journals that they right. subscribe to. Right. <clears throat> and the second one, and I think this is happening, I think the journal is losing its hold <coughs> and the article is becoming more the unit right. of conference, of, of commerce. Right. <coughs> because of the fact, 
of selective indexing in databases and data right. databases where you no longer see the whole issue, you just see what you're looking no, at. No, I mean, it, it is like a CD and, mm -hmm. and like I, iTunes, basically. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah the album. Yeah. The same way the yeah. album has right. disappeared, right. so is the journal. Right. Um, this right. has been something that I think uh, those of us in libraries for a long time have said, let's disambiguate the journal. I don't care what, what you know where this comes from. I just want to get this article. And basically, that's what we do when we buy an article for interlibrary loan. When we don't own something and we have to go buy it for you, uh, sometimes we borrow it from them, we don't borrow it. They give it to us and then we give them something in return. Yeah, I think, or we buy it for you. Yeah, I think, I think the only problem with that kind of a la carte is that, that I think it, it can get people into, I mean, it is kind of like what, what sometimes like people get their news from their own. So if you're conservative, you, you know, you get your news from Fox. If you're, if, if you're liberal from, you know, from CNBC, and, and I think that, 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 that you can wind up just getting the articles that are in your sub sub subfield and when you pick up a journal and you a, a, a kind of general interest journal and you see all the great things happening in fields near and even not so near yours, I think there's something to be said for that. So you know, if there were a way that you could get sort of the news, um, you know, like the, the kind of headlines of things being done and then well, you could- there is. And you then could you could dig do, deeper for the things you really want. You could want. do the table of contents. Yeah. Uh, which we've yeah. tried to do on, a, on various occasions and very, over various years. You would have a table of contents, yeah. um, always, and then you would just pick the journals that, or the articles that we would buy and pay for. I probably will never see that in my lifetime, but at some point that may be the way that libraries start to pay for the kind of materials that we're paying for now. We spend over $8 million on journals and databases. I think the greatest advance of the 21st century is the article linker. It is fabulous. It's fabulous. It has saved me so much time. Or you just click and it tells you whether you've got it or not. And if you don't have it, you really want it. It connects you with interlibrary loan. Yeah. But just to, you know, I mean, to thumb through those dusty volumes and those yeah. dust mites and have at it, Wayne. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like what I what what I what I picked is my graphic. Yeah. yeah, I know. But thank you all. I thought thank you. 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 Thank you